What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to an early morning week nine edition of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2021 CFL regular season and postseason. And before we go any further, in all due deference, I am Bridgewater's Finest, I am Blockbuster underscore guy, what I also am is a committed and humble servant serving in day one of the reign of King Caleb Evans. Finally, somebody in that franchise listened to me. How many weeks has it been? How many weeks has it been that I've been talking about Caleb Evans on this show? It's been at least three, maybe it's been a full month. Caleb Evans had to be the starting quarterback for the Ottawa Red Blacks as soon as humanly possible. Now, maybe this was as soon as humanly possible, but what did he do? First two drives that he touched the football? Touchdowns. What happened? The Ottawa Red Blacks won a football game last night. I've, I don't think I've ever been happier to get a straight up pick wrong. Genuinely, I don't think I've ever been happier because it just feels so good to have been so right about what a team needed to do. And then they did it. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? I was a hundred percent on the money. King Caleb Evans, all hail. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about what happened in week eight before we move on to the picks for the three remaining games in week nine. So look, based on what happened last night, obviously I'm 0-1 straight up in week nine because I took Edmonton to win that game. I did take Ottawa with the points, so I am 1-0 against the spread. I think I took the under on 44, and that was pretty well doomed to failure almost right from the start because... Caleb Evans. So I went 0-1 on the total. So off to a slow start in week nine. Week eight was kind of the same thing. I only went four and five in week eight, including one and two straight up, one and two against the spread. I did get two of the three totals and the totals are, at least relatively speaking, maybe turning around a little bit. I, I hesitate to even say that. So four and five is a 44.44% week in week eight, uh, straight up, I'm even money 15 and 15 on the year, 13 and 17 against the spread, 12 and 18 on the totals, 40 and 50 overall on the year for 44.44. But again, I look at it and I still sit here and maybe this is me making excuses because obviously my picks are not where I wanted them to be to this point in the season. So if it's an excuse, it's an excuse to you and, and I understand. But if you look at those, again, those first Two of those first three weeks, when I went two and ten, if you take every week except those two, now of course those two weeks count, and I'm not trying to say, well, we should eliminate those two weeks. No, no, no. Those two weeks definitely count. But every week other than those two weeks, I'm actually like six games over 500 for like 54.5%. So it's still not where I want to be, but I also don't sit here and think that I'm actually a 44%. I had two really bad weeks that I'm still trying to make up for. Another strong week in CFL fantasy, despite the objections of uh, of, of a few. Uh, moved back up to 8th place out of 82 in that league. 91.7 points in week 8 is my second best overall score on the season. 630.4 points overall. My week 8 MVP, obviously Lucky Whitehead for the BC Lions. Two receiving touchdowns, six catches, 111 yards. Good for 30.3 points. He put up a massive performance. My week nine lineup in CFL Fantasy, which has, of course, already started, is right in front of your eyes right now. And as you can see, aside from James Wilder, who put up a solid performance last night of 14.9 points, we are hammering, hammering the Saskatchewan Rough Riders this week. We are stacking Cody Fajardo at starting quarterback with William Powell at running back. Keon Schaefer-Baker and Braden Lanius at wide receiver, and we're also tossing in Lewis in the flex position. So there was a couple of options that I had looked at in flex because I had about, about three, a little over $3,000 to spend in the flex position. Let's just go all in on one team here, the team that I do think is going to score the most points this week. You'll have to hold on to see if I think they're going to win or not, but I think they're going to score the most points this week, so why not stack that quarterback with as many of his weapons as humanly possible? And so that's what we did.
The remainder of the Week 9 schedule looks like this. We've got Toronto on the natural bye, and of course Ottawa and Edmonton have already played this week. We've got Winnipeg traveling to BC to take on the Lions. Montreal is in Hamilton to take on the Ticats, another pivotal East Division matchup. And the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the aforementioned Rough Riders, are in Calgary to take on the Stamps. We're doing a do's and don'ts edition again this week, only because certain teams didn't get the opportunity to get the do's and don'ts treatment from last week. So we're going to just go back and we're going to make sure that these teams get the opportunity to get do's and don't So we're going to start at BC Place, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in BC to take on the Lions. Bombers 6-1, and one, winners of four straight games coming off of the bye last week. Their last game was a 37-22 win in Edmonton against the Elks. Uh, absolute swarming defensive performance. This game was back in week seven. Swarming defensive performance. You're talking about a pick six. You're talking about a scoop and score. This defense is dominant and everybody knows it. And they had that on full display against, you know, a fairly inexperienced quarterback. They don't get a chance to play an inexperienced quarterback this week. They have to play Mike Riley and the BC Lions. Four and three. Losers last time out dropping a game against Saskatchewan in BC. 31 to 24. Boy, that game looked good for a little while. And then it just wound up being very not good. And again, we gave BC the do's and don'ts treatment, and I flat out said, I told you not to think you could win the game on 50 offensive plays. What happens? They ran 49, only possessed the ball for a little over 25 and a half minutes. Wouldn't you know who won the pony? That wasn't good enough to beat an elite team in the CFL. So here we go. Once again, do's and don'ts. If you're the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, do fill up the secondary. It is absolutely forgivable in a matchup like this. And stuff like this, of course, is always matchup dependent. It is absolutely forgivable in a matchup like this to sacrifice the run defense in order to fill up the secondary. BC only runs for 66.6 rush yards per game. That is the worst mark in the CFL. They run the least in the CFL. They are very dependent, obviously, on Michael Riley and those uh, wide receivers, very dependent on the pass game. So it is totally forgivable to only rush three and drop a bunch of guys back into the secondary to try to plug up all levels of that passing game. You don't want to completely abandon the run defense because Michael Riley, of course, can make plays with his feet. So you don't want to absolutely abandon it completely, but it is totally forgivable to sacrifice a bit of the run defense, which Winnipeg hasn't been great at this year anyway, in order to fully focus on stopping the pass. If you're the BC Lions, stop me if you've heard this before, do find ways to win time of possession. It's not an overrated stat in this league as far as I'm concerned. You've got to find ways to get extra possessions, run more plays, control the clock more than they were able to against a good team last week. You got to run the ball a little bit more. Maybe you got to run more check down plays, high percentage passes. Not that Michael Riley is like throwing 60% and it's a bunch of incompletions, but super efficient, high percentage passes that keep the chains moving, longer drives win football games and possessing the football on offense wins football games. So the Lions have got to figure out ways to extend that or they're not going to beat a team like Winnipeg. On the flip side, if you're the Bombers, don't overload Andrew Harris if he's not 100% healthy. I have this nagging suspicion, <laughs> which is pretty well confirmed by the practice reports, that Andrew Harris is not operating at 100%. First of all, I think he's only got one touchdown on the year. Obviously, he missed the first couple of weeks. I think he's only got one rush touchdown on the year. He didn't participate in practice on Monday. He was a full participant yesterday on Tuesday. But the fact that he went from a DNP to a full, clearly there's something going on there. So you can't risk that level, that caliber of a player this early in the season. Because guess what? You're going to need him down the stretch. And down the stretch, you're going to need him to be Andrew Harris. And if you're the BC Lions, don't ask your defense to perform a miracle. I think points are going to be relatively hard to come by in this game. So you, you can't ask your defense to, you know, make up for, let's say, a couple of offensive turnovers, make up for a multiple, you know, two and outs in a row. You have to be safe with the football. You have to be efficient with the football. You can't ask your defense to perform a miracle here because if you do, I don't think the miracle will answer the door.
We've seen it at multiple points this season. This BC Lions team is capable of competing and beating anybody in this league. I just feel like against a team like the Bombers, any mistake you make is going to be magnified tenfold because this team does not screw around. It generates turnovers. It scores points off of turnovers and it, it makes you make mistakes and any mistake you make Again, it's just it's magnified that much more because it's against Winnipeg. Even though the game's in BC, I, I've got to take the Bombers here. I still think this is a good spot for them. And against the spread, I think it's a great spot for them. Let's take Winnipeg in BC to hang another loss on the Lions, move their record to an even 4-4. Four and four. Ultimately, what that comes down to is I just don't think BC is going to do what they need to do to win. The Red Blacks did, but I just, I just don't think BC is going to in this game. On the line, Winnipeg's laying three points as a road favorite. So they're a road favorite, but they're not a heavy road favorite. I like them to win. It's a relatively small price to pay, although it's like right at the highest range of when I'll use that phrase, which is minus three. I'm just going to go ahead and lay the points on Winnipeg. I like them to win. It feels like a bad hedge. So we're going to go ahead and lay the points on the Bombers. Total in the game set at 52 and a half points. This is a big total. These are two talented defenses. Winnipeg on the uh, any total this year over 46. So 46 and a half and up. The Bombers are 0-2 to the over. If I like them to win, I think I'm going to lean on the underside of things this week, even though point scoring is finally up in the CFL. Uh, 52 and a half, it's the biggest number of the week. I think I got to lean under on this one. So we're going to go under 52 and a half points in BC Winnipeg. Let's go Bombers 26, Lions 21. And we're going to go for the sponsorship plug early in this episode. I will take this opportunity to shout out my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. Ladies and gentlemen, nerdtees.ca. Use that promo code of BWFINEST. That is going to save you 15% at checkout. You are going to get free shipping on any order over $100. If you are in Canada, of course, if you're one of my American viewers, kudos for watching a CFL video, but you're also going to get a great conversion rate on the US dollar. That is an excellent time to buy as far as I'm concerned. Today's blend is the same blend from yesterday. It is white truffle. It is a dessert tea. It is delicious. It smells fantastic. It almost smells like a bakery in here. So many great options. Dozens and dozens of incredible tea blends from nerdteas.ca. Promo code is BWFINEST. Save your money, get your free shipping, find yourself something to love, or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. Let's go to Hamilton now, Montreal in town, to take on the Ticats. Alouettes at two and four, losers of two straight games, and playing on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. If you've been watching my NFL show, you know that being on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games makes you nigh on um, unbeatable this season. Uh, not quite the same in the CFL. But Alouettes again, two and four, losers of two straight, losing in Toronto 30 to 27 last week. And again, I gave them the do's and don'ts treatment and I told them flat out, you can't lose the penalty battle in this game. Toronto takes five penalties for 45 yards under their season average in both cases. Montreal takes 11 for 129 because, you know, why not? For Hamilton, now at 4-3 and three on the season, winners of two straight games, winning that game in Ottawa 24-7 last week. Hey, look, I told you to shorten the game, way to shorten the game. You focused up, you didn't, you weren't sloppy with the football, you ran the ball 29 times for 118 yards rushing, that's pretty well a repeat performance from the week before that, you only took three penalties for 30 yards, never trailed in this football game, they didn't look ahead, they focused on the game in front of them, just like I told them to. Now this week, if you are Montreal, do take the football and shove it down Hamilton's throat. You are the number one run team in the CFL for a reason. Now, the Ticats are the number three run defense in the CFL. This team can stop the run. But Montreal's not just the number one run offense in the CFL. They're the number one run offense in the CFL by a ton. The team that is directly behind them, I believe it's Saskatchewan, Montreal leads them by like 40%. It's like 150-some rush yards per game, I think 154, to like 110. So you got to take that ball, you got to shove that ball down Hamilton's throat. I, I couldn't, I wanted to take stand back in fantasy this week. 
I kind of faded that opinion a little bit. Maybe that comes back to bite me in the butt, but I, I genuinely think that's the Alouette's key to success in this game is run, 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 run the football. If you're the Thai Cats, even though David Watford looks like he's still going to be in at quarterback, do take some shots down the football field. The Montreal Alouettes allow the second highest quarterback rating, or as they call in this league, QB efficiency. The second highest QB efficiency in the league allowed belongs to the Montreal Alouettes, and they're allowing a CFL worst 9.6 yards per completed pass. Take some shots down the football field. Didn't really see it in the game last week. They were against Ottawa. You didn't necessarily need it. This Montreal team can score points. Montreal is also one of the most penalized teams in the CFL. You're probably likely to get some pass interference calls out of it. So take some shots downfield. See what happens. If you're the Alouettes, I'm not going to waste your time by saying don't take penalties because you're not going to listen to me anyway. I've been screaming at you for two years. Instead, what I'm going to say, if you're the Montreal Alouettes, don't get cute with the football. The Hamilton Tiger Cats are plus seven in turnover ratio so far this year. That is the best in the East Division. They've also generated 56 points to this point in the season off of turnovers. That is the best in the CFL. Montreal cannot afford to turn the ball over in this game. Maybe not even once, but if they turn it over once, you definitely cannot afford to turn it over twice. If you are the Tiger Cats, do not lose at the line of scrimmage or lose consistently at the line of scrimmage in this game losing the line will mean losing the game hamilton is allowing a cfl worst 23 sacks so far this season so what's that 23 sacks in seven games so that's a little more than three sacks a game it is the worst mark in the cfl the alouettes the number two pass rush in the cfl having generated 16 sacks to this point in six games on the season they cannot allow watford to be you know clobbered around back there like a like a pinball by no means is it too early in the season to start looking at playoff crossover scenarios montreal has to start getting desperate here not only now do they have the same number of wins as ottawa so now not only do they have to worry about the team in their own division that's behind them but they've got to look at the teams in the west this is a dog fight now between everybody in the league I don't necessarily know that Montreal is going to catch the teams that are ahead of them in the East. They still might, but I don't necessarily know that they have a good shot at doing that. I say all that to say Montreal has to be entering desperation mode. It feels early because it's only like halfway through the season, but they have to be entering desperation mode now because the Ticats are playing really good football and they're getting healthier. Braylon Addison was just brought back onto the active roster. Don't know whether he plays this week or not, but they're getting healthier which means they're going to be getting better. Toronto, I don't know who's the better team really, even after that game last week between these two. The Owls need this game more. They have to play this game like it's a one-game playoff to make the playoffs or not make the playoffs. They have to play a desperate mode of football. I'm going to take the team in desperation mode. It's not a great upset play because Hamilton is genuinely in multiple areas the better football team and there's a much easier path for Hamilton to win this game than the opposite but Hamilton doesn't need the same kind of desperation that Montreal does make no mistake about it this Ticats team is only vulnerable until they get healthy again once they're healthy I don't think there's going to be any stopping this team so the time has to be now if you're going to beat Hamilton now's going to be the time so I like the Alouettes to do it on the line, Hamilton's only laying two and a half points as a home favorite. I totally understand somebody going on either side of this line, but since I'm taking the Alouettes in the upset win, I'll take the two and a half points as well. Total in the game set at 48 and a half. The Alouettes are three and one to the over on the road so far this year. The offenses and the defense for, uh, for Montreal are both in the 30s in their last three. So they're scoring, they're giving up a lot of points as well. So I think I'm going to go over on this one. It's a relatively high number for this season in the CFL, but between these two teams, I think you're going to see a little bit of a shootout. So I'm going to go over the 48 and a half points in Hamilton, Montreal. Let's go Al's 27, Hamilton 26. Montreal might win this thing on a last second field goal. And our last game of the week sees the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at 5-2, and two, winners of two straight games, on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games, heading to Calgary to take on the 2-5 and five Stamps, who dropped their last game back in Week 7, so they are coming off of a bye. 
Riders went to BC last week and picked up that aforementioned 31-24 to win over the Lions. I thought the Lions would win that game, but Saski gets the job done. And hey, I told him, I told him, let Cody Fajardo responsibly cook. That is exactly what they did. Way to let Cody cook. 24 completed passes, 311 total yards in that game. He did have a turnover, but he was responsible for both of Saskatchewan's offensive touchdowns. They let him cook. He did his job. They got the win. Calgary dropping a six-point decision in Hamilton their last time out, 23-17. That was back in week seven, and they turned the ball over five times. And that just underscored a top-to-bottom sloppy performance that was absolutely abjectly dominated by the defense on the other side. So, if you're the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, do um, that again. Just basically do what you did last week. You did it against BC, who is a better team than the one you're playing this week, so... You know, just go ahead and do that again. But offensively, look, let the ball fly a little more. Fajardo's got a good arm. He should have, there's no reason he shouldn't have 300 yards passing in this game. Calgary allows the second most yards total and the most passing yards this year. Statistically, they are a worse secondary than Ottawa. If you're Calgary, do let Carey carry. Shut up, this is my favorite one. Um, Kadeem Carey. Can we let Kadeem Carey carry the ball, please? Unless he's, like, brutally, brutally injured, in which case he shouldn't be playing. Kadeem Carey has had fewer than 10 carries of the football in the run game in three of the last four games. Calgary has lost all three of those games. He only has 10-plus carries once in the last four games. That was the game they won. It's almost like Kadeem Carey in the run game is kind of important to the success of the Calgary Stampeders. And again, I understand the game scripts argument. I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately. But like, I understand that they've been in negative game scripts because their defense, total defense, is not very good. So they allow a bunch of yardage, long drives. They allow points. I get that they got to try to play from behind. So maybe the run game is less prioritized. But he's not even getting a ton of work in the pass game. Kadeem Carey is too good of a weapon to not have the football in his hands. If you're the Riders, don't let this game get sloppy. The sloppier these games get, the more unpredictable they get. Absolutely anything can happen. We saw that happen, I think, both games against Winnipeg. Now, I understand, obviously, the rivalry is there. The Banjo Bowl, the Labor Day game, I understand that. Those games got sloppy. Crazy undisciplined. And what happened in both of those games? Saski got spanked in both of those games. These are the two most penalized teams in the CFL. The cleaner you can keep this game, the better it fares for the better football team, which I think in this case is very clearly Sasky. And speaking of the better team, if you're the Calgary Stampeders, don't hand over possessions to the better team. Calgary minus nine on the turnover ratio so far this year. Not good. Sasky, the second best team in the CFL in terms of points generated directly off of turnovers. Hamilton has put up 56 points off their turnovers. Saskatchewan has put up 52. So obviously an exceptional team at generating turnovers and turning those turnovers into points. If Calgary starts giving them extra possessions through fumbles, interceptions, what have you, it's going to be a long day for the Stamps. Uh, look, Calgary's only 1-3 and three against West Division opponents this year. They are ramp have a rampant lack of consistency. There's This team is very, maybe more so than any other team in the league, is so up and down and up and down. You don't really know which Stamps team you're going to get week in and week out. I have to fade them against one of the top two to three teams in the league. So we're, we're definitely on the riders uh, to win this football game in Calgary. Let's take Saski to beat the Stamps. Like this might be a popular upset pick. I can totally see how it could be because next week they're going to play this game in Saskatchewan. So maybe you could catch the riders looking ahead to that game because it's at home. But I think they draw first blood in this thing. And, you know, probably depending on what happens this week, probably sweeps this home and home. On the line, the Stamps are giving three and a half points as the home dog. And look, it's less than a touchdown. Don't ask me to take less than a touchdown's worth of points on one of the weakest defenses in the league. Let's just take the Riders and lay those points. Saskatchewan minus the three and a half. Total of the game set at 49 points. Uh, I don't love this. I think this is actually very close to what the final score is going to be. I think it's like within a field goal either way. 
I think Saski's probably going to be the highest scoring team of the week. So given that, I guess I'll lean to the over on it. But again, this is a real coin flip number. I don't really love this either way. I'm going to go over on this one. We're going to take over 49 points in Saskatchewan, Calgary. Let's go Riders 28, Stamps 24. There you go, folks. The picks are in for the rest of the week nine games here in the CFL. We'll go over them here with you one more time. I like Winnipeg to go into BC, get the win against the Lions, and I'm going to lay the three points on the Blue Bombers as the road favorite in a game that stays under 52.5 points. I like Montreal to go into Hamilton and upset the Ticats desperation mode. They got to have it. I think they get it. So therefore, I'm going to take the 2.5 points with Montreal as the road underdog in a game that goes over 48.5 points. And I like Saski to go into Calgary. I'm on all the road teams this week. Saski goes into Calgary, beats the Stampeders. We're going to lay the three and a half points on Saskatchewan in a game that goes over 49 points. Week 9 show is in the books, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching. Obviously, the, the early portion of this episode that I put out on, Tuesday, on uh, Monday, sorry, on Sunday. And, of course, for watching this episode, for watching the NFL show, for watching everything, for watching all the content, that the hours of content that I put out on a weekly basis, just sitting here giving you, so far this year, mediocre football picks. But they're going to turn around. They're going to get better, I believe. The, the, the King Caleb Evans has made me believe in things again. So I believe we're going to turn this around this week. Thank you so much for watching. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees and humble servant to King Caleb Evans. That's the Week 9 Show. We will see you again in Week 10.